OK, so any ideas, thoughts on what is going on in this problem? Yeah, uh, let's do Jordan. OK. OK, so you're saying that the agents have not produced yet, or did they produce? They did produce, but uh -huh. eventually it gets to the point where it's still doing something that's not yet produced. Okay, so the trick is that that's close enough, right? So the, the, the smokers, the agents don't run until the smokers have run. And um, the smokers are stuck somewhere waiting on something, uh, maybe a missing ingredient, maybe something else. And then the agents are blocked and the smokers are blocked. Now, the, the second half of the question is what are the smokers stuck on? So, thank you. So, let's take a look at what exactly is happening here. So, we know that our agent produces two things at a time. Okay? So, let's say they produced paper and matches. So, recall we have three smokers. Smoker two. Smoker three. So smoker one has the paper. Smoker two has the tobacco. And smoker three has the matches. So let's say the moment the agent has put the matches on the pa uh, the, the matches on the table, agent one or or smoker one was able to grab a hold of the matches. Okay. Now, what, what smoker one needs next is tobacco. But we don't have any tobacco. So we're going to suck. S1 is waiting for tobacco while holding the matches. Right? So what's going to happen next? Um, who, needs, who else needs paper, both S2 and S3? Let's assume that S3 gets the paper. So. S2, oh sorry, S2 gets the paper. S2 has tobacco, S2 has paper, they need matches, but the matches are held by S1. So we are stuck in this case where S1 is waiting, is waiting for tobacco, but we don't have any tobacco. S2 has paper and tobacco, but they don't have any matches because S1 has the matches. So S2 is stuck, S1 is stuck, S3 is stuck because there's nothing else left to do for them. Right? There's nothing on the table. So they're, they're unfortunate, but they're waiting for um, new ingredients. Both S1 and S2 have two of the three ingre ingredients each, but they're both waiting on each other. OK? So in that case, that's how we got to a deadlock. So let's see how we can use the banker's algorithm that we just discussed to see how we can um, um, decide whether um, which which requests are we going to. Should we have given the paper um, or the matches to S1 or not? Say that again. No, we shouldn't because we don't have everything. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so the request, let's go. Um, request is S1 requests paper. So we're going to uh, uh, request sorry, matches. So 
So we're going to represent this again as a table, S1, S2, and S3. So what the Banker's algorithm is going to do is going to say, assume we give the request to S2. So we have here paper, tobacco, and matches. Or let's do the other order. OK, so S1 is going to request for matches. So let's assume we give it to it. We haven't given anything else to any other smoker. For it to run, S1 needs um, So here we say needs. So it already has paper. It needs matches and tobacco. So I'm going to uh, put a little one here. Then S2 already has tobacco, so it only needs paper and matches. S3 already has uh, matches, so it only needs paper and tobacco. OK. Is this matrix clear? OK, so now it's going to, what do we have available left? Oops, we call that the free. We only have, we produced matches and paper. We gave the matches to S1, so we only have paper left. So the OS is going to ask itself this question. Is this a safe state to be in? Right? So it's obviously not a safe state. Right? Because S1 requested matches. It needs paper. So I can't give it to it. Uh, oh, sorry. It has paper. So my resource is not useful because they don't need any paper. They need tobacco to run. But they can't run. If S2 wants to run, then again, I can't give anything to S2 because um, I can give them the paper, but that's pretty much useless, right? And S3 can't actually get anything. So this is a not safe state. So S1's request is denied. And this is how the banker's algorithm works. You every time you make a request, yeah, the, the operating system is going to run this algorithm. It's going to ask itself, is this a safe state or not? Can I get out of this pickle or can't I? If the answer is no, it's going to deny your request. Yeah. So is it past paper to safe state before it gives matches to S1? Yes. Or? Yes. So it kind of simulates what's hap what's going to happen if I give you the request. If it leads to a bad state, then it's going to deny the request. So let's take another um, case where S2 requests for paper. Requests paper. So S2 requests paper means we are here. One, zero, zero. S1, 0, 0, 0, S3, 0, 0, 0. So then our needs are 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Paper. Matches, tobacco, paper, tobacco. And our available or free is now the matches. Now, when this request is, when S2 makes the request for paper, is the OS is going to ask itself, is this a safe state to be in? If the state is safe, then it's going to grant this request. The OS is going to look at this. 
um, can can it lead to a safe state? Is there a safe state that I can get to from this state? And it's going to look at, well, S2 requires matches. I do have matches, so I can give matches to S2. S2 can complete, then my agents can run again. Right? So in that case, it's going to say safe state and access or request grant. So it's going to grant S2's request. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is either S2 is going to make a request for matches. In that case, we're all good. Or S1 is going to make the request for matches, but we already know that we're going to deny S1's request for matches. So in this case, we know that the only possible way that the OS is only going to guarantee one possible execution path, which is S2 smoking. In this case, we don't have any problems. Um, we can solve the, um, the, the, the any deadlock issues that we have. So in a sense, we're preemptively checking each request if we're going to get any deadlocks. If the answer is no, we grant those requests. If the answer is yes, we block those requests. So now the question is, is this practical? So what do you think? Is this a practical solution? Yeah. I guess like small agencies can do more. They don't want to. Yeah, exactly. So here it becomes an issue of performance. And performance under the banker's algorithm is bad. So if you want to take a look at the, um, this is going to be O of M plus N squared, I think. Um, so it's it's quadratic, right? Now, quadratic is okay. Um, you don't have to worry about these things. So if, if quadratic is okay for small, for small pieces, but remember, this is happening at each and every request. So every time you call some way, every time you call mutex lock, this is going to happen. So imagine how many times you call some weight or some post on the lifetime of a process, right? Now imagine this other condition case. We have a huge database. We have a lock on each row in that database. And then I have a web server that's servicing requests from that database. I got a thousand requests at the same time. This means I'm going to have to check 1000 of these operations at the same time. And that's not going to be feasible. So in a sense, this is good theoretically. It's nice, nice theoretical tool. But in practice, it not work, does not work in practice. So what other techniques would you suggest that the OS does other than this guy, this one? So ways to handle ways the OS. Handles that locks. So one we saw oops, one deadlock avoidance. So we introduced the banker's algorithm. But we saw it's not very practical. So what other techniques would you think the OS can do? Yeah. We do the opposite. So we wait until we get a deadlock and then if we get a deadlock, undo it and then maybe run the banker's algorithm then just once to yes. get us out of the situation. Yep, exactly. So what the other technique is basically called deadlock detection and recovery. So basically, when we get to a state where a lot of threads are sleeping, we run the banker's algorithm to detect if there, we run the detection half of 
the banker's algorithm to detect if there is a deadlock or not. If there is a deadlock, then we must initially initi initiate a recovery approach. One of those recovery approach would be just kill all the processes involved in the deadlock, right? One, one other approach would be, you know, try killing one of them or two of them and see if that helps. If it helps, then we're good. If it doesn't, then we have to kill more threads and more processes. What potential problems do you think can arise from this approach? Have you guys used torrent files before? Download the games and all of those things. OK, so what happens in there? You get like several threads that are downloading the same thing from several places, right? And they're all waiting on the network drive. Because they're all downloading huge chunks of data. Is that a deadlock? Not really, it's just an IO that's taking too long because I need, I don't know, 10 gigabytes of data. And each thread is waiting for, let's say, two gigabytes of data from the network card. So that takes a while to happen. And then once that happens, the, 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 the threads are all awoken in a sense. Yeah. Okay. I don't know how exactly. I don't know if they even have each thread per 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 seed. Uh, I'm just <laughs> making my own torrent browser now, or torrent uh, client. Okay. Um, I do know that Firefox and Chrome in the early days they had one process per uh, per tab. So that's another another ability. So there's no way to f know if a long sleep is actually a deadlock or not a deadlock. OK, so there is one third approach, which is the, the approach taken by most operating systems today. So let's see what it is. If I run this and there's a deadlock, what is the OS doing? What's the OS going to do about it? If I say I leave this running till tomorrow's class and I come back in, would anything change? No, nope. right? So the third technique or the third, uh, third algorithm is called the ostrich algorithm, which is basically says, stick your hand in the sand and say, not my problem. So the OS is going to say, well, got a deadlock, too bad. I'm not responsible for fixing your code, so you deal with it. If you crash your machine, not my problem, right? Um, so the basic idea is do nothing. So it's the developer's job to write deadlock free. OK, so those are the three ways in which the operating systems can act, can act or modern operating systems can take care of deadlocks. Usually most of them go for option number three and say it's the responsibility of the user to make sure that their develop that the developer to make sure that their code is deadlock. All right, questions. So tomorrow we're going to just quickly solve the cigarette smokers problem and figure out how do we solve that problem and, and think about it because it's not an obvious um, solution. And then we'll start our talk about virtual memory, which is the next big module of our class. After that, the last week, we're going to be talking about operating system security, doing some fun stuff in there. So um, that's the outline of the rest of the course. See you tomorrow. So we don't have um, it's going to be due. Wednesday, but we're going to solve it tomorrow in class.